Thank you. Um, thank you, Sally, for these kind words, and, and thank you for CGP to invite me uh, to share ideas just two days before uh, this uh, big agreement enter into force. It, it's really something incredible that we, we got on the 12th of December 2015, a very ambitious agreement, something that I think every country was probably not prepared to accept, really. And at the same time, these countries confirm they were ready to implement that by ratifying at the speed which is totally unprecedented in, in international law. I like this photo, of course, at the end of the meeting. We are just so happy, everyone, uh, that we, we could get that uh, after weeks and weeks of work. And so today, I would like to uh, outline, of course, what we have in our hands with this Paris Agreement, the challenge ahead, and um, why I think that 2018 is a very important landmark, a very important milestone, and some lessons I can draw from COP21, again, to use this for uh, further improvement. Sally has been very clear in showing what is the carbon budget about and what we should do, and it is absolutely a lot. So it, it's better to now understand what is really ahead of us and uh, what this agreement, in a way, uh, serve as a, a framework and at the same time, understand that this is not the whole thing, of course. Most of everything would stand in domestic action, the change of behavior, the change in technology, as she said very clearly. So on this, what do we have in our hands in the, and what are the defining features of the Paris Agreement? Uh, of course, is above all an agreement about mitigation and with a global goal, which is the in hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees C above pre-industrial levels, and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. And I'm sure this will be part of the discussion, uh, why, in a way, did we push the ball so in such a difficult zone? We know already, and as Sally explained, it's already very, very difficult to stabilize uh, temperature <coughs> well below 2 degrees C and 1.5 may seem or can seem unattainable. But it is there, and in particular, this translates uh, beyond the temperature goal into what does it mean in terms of the carbon budget. And uh, we don't have the phrase in total here, but the complete formulation is that we have to get to net zero emission by the second hand of the century. So that's what exactly Sally explained to us before. So that is in the agreement. The second feature is having a really a recognition that adaptation will be a main feature of our future because we have to increase the ability to adapt because already the adverse impacts of climate change are there uh, and we still are very lagging behind on how we we, we get societies, infrastructure more resilient to this adverse impact. And there is an interesting third element in this global goal of the agreement is the finance. Um, and in a way, it was a little bit of a surprise for many countries and finally they accept that to do all this, we have to reorient our investment flows, public and private, domestic and international, consistent with this climate change mitigation and adaptation objective. And this was, in a way, uh, uh, it is a very important building block, uh, again, for future action. The other, the other second feature of this Paris Agreement is, is, in a way, based on domestic decision, which are expressed in what we call, in our jargon, the national determined contribution. Why is this so? I don't have so much time to explain why. It is not simply commitment, but that's the uh, subtlety of the diplomacy. But anyway, that's what the countries um, on a unilateral basis are ready to uh, engage in doing. So this is the second, of course, very important feature. Uh, already 163 countries, so most countries, have took these individual commitments, normally most of them by, with a time horizon which is 2030. 
But there is, of course, a major feature in this agreement is that to recognize that <clears throat> uh, it is clear that this first row of climate plans or climate proposal emanating from countries doesn't put us on track for the well below 2 degrees C and even more for the 1.5. So we are not with this first row of 163 contribution. We are not on tracks to be in the envelope Sally describes uh, until 2050 and even beyond. So that's why uh, the, we have built in and recognizing very early in the process that we were not there, that we have to build in a constantly raise of ambition in the agreement itself. That's why we built a system of reporting and measurement, which of course that the way countries can trust each other because they just follow what the other one is doing, which is very important, in particular, not only on the mitigation objective, but as well on the financial and the technology contributions and cooperation. The, that every five years we reconsider uh, and we increase the ambition, uh, again, just to try to bring us back to what should be a reasonable pathway to be comp compatible with the two degree C. Um, and uh, the, the, the last one is we rely on government, it's the engagement and obligation of governments, but to just to get Paris done, and that will be the same in the future, we need the involvement of not only government, but the whole society, and in particular, the decision makers in this society, which are in nowadays m very much the local governments, being region or provinces or cities, and the businesses. So these are the big feature of what we did in Paris. And in a way, we of course, we believe in international law, it's important, but you know, there is no global government, there is no global justice, at least for most of the issues. So it's very much the implementation, the efficiency, the effectiveness of any agreement will rely on the deep conviction, the deep expectation that that will be the new direction of the global economy. So we, we try to build in, not in the agreement itself, but across many actors, across many constituencies, the expectation that the low carbon economy was there to stay, it was, it was underway, it was inevitable. So the trend, the train was going in that direction. And if you were a reasonable actor, in the global economy, you would not like to stay out this, outside this train. So that's why we worked with many actors to get the same message after the 12th of December. I can tell you even that when I entered the government in 2014, I started from the press communique I would like to see on the 12th of December, and then walked down, walked back, what kind of strategy I need to get that. And the, Press communique was not, we got a big, beautiful agreement. It was, this low carbon economy is the future, and we better be in there. And that finally worked because of the support, the contribution, the cooperation from the civil society, the NGOs, the business, and the local authorities. So that's why I think, I hope, this Paris Agreement will be remembered as a turning point. It's not the whole. It's just a tipping point to redirect our activities in a different direction. But we have a lot of challenges ahead. The challenge of implementation first, uh, because these national develop determined contribution for the moment are standalone climate change mitigation adaptation. They are not economic development plans. And this can't work. Uh, we have to embed this climate change mitigation adaptation policy into a broader long-term socioeconomic development strategy. So we are not there. This requires strong leadership at the highest political level and a close coordination process between many, many ministries. So we need to get from climate to economic policy. This contribution, when you look, like, you look that from a financial perspective, for example, they are still too generic. We need much more preci precision, granularity. We need to have detailed sectoral plans which means passing new legislation, implementing new policy and regulation, 
and which means designing investment plans. Again, if you would like to follow what Sally advised us to, to look at, the different sectors, how much uh, we have to electrify our type of energy consumption or decarbonize this production of electricity, we need plans, we need sectoral plans, we need policy measures. This has to be done by now. Uh, we have a, a number of toolkit to do that, uh, but, um, <clears throat> and, but uh, in particular, uh, we, we know that we will have progressively to put a price on carbon, whatever method you choose for that, but it's a condition of success, not sufficient. We have to invest above all in zero carbon and climate resilient infrastructure. Uh, we, we know that the world we have to invest about 90 trillion in infrastructure over the next 15 years. Uh, it's not 19 trillion just, uh, it is not so much above what is needed anyway. So the, it's like three to 4% additional to whatever every country at world level would have to do just to replace or to create new energy infrastructure. So this investment, of course, is a big challenge. And that's why financing and investment have to be mobilized and better deployed for a multitude of different domestic and external sources. That's what, where private and public finance has to work together because we need a lot of leverage to incentivize the private capital, both national, domestic, or international, to come into this new sector on infrastructure, in particular in developing countries where two-thirds of this investment has to take place. So multilateral development banks have a key role to play in this system because they have to <coughs> share risks, allowing the international cost of capital to go down. In many developing countries, this cost is far too high, far too high, to just get investment that can be profitable. And uh, I have many examples of countries having to borrow at 7, 9, 10, 15% sometimes to invest in infrastructure. This is not viable. So there were public funding, that, that's where multilateral development banks has to share risks to incentivize this to happen. And you know, <clears throat> Uh, this is where we are, and so we have a challenge of raising ambition because the contribution we have on the table brings us more on the 2.5 to 3 degrees uh, uh, increase in temperature, and of course we are still, as I said, uh, not on tracks for even the to below 2 degrees C, which is the, the minimum we, we wanted to achieve. How we can uh, really take this challenge of raising ambitions. According to most studies, the level of ambition of this current set of indices need to be more than double or almost triple to have a likely chance of limiting this temperature increase below two degrees C. It's not a technical question. It's first of all a policy question uh, because it's not just to implement this current set of indices and I told you before, we have a lot of work to do to have them as a sort of a real climate plans, investment plans. But it's now to begin to implement climate action that are even more ambitious than the current set of indices and to start doing this now. It's, it's complicated because when countries, and in a way that's the hope, countries came before Paris, most of them came on the last months before December, and present their plans. But at that point in time, they didn't know exactly what the others were prepared to do really. And above all, they didn't know the rules, the kind of obligation, because the, the negotiation was far from being finished, from being achieved. So in a way, they put forward plans who were the most conservative in a way, compared to what they really could do already. And so we should not be, of course, captured, lock in, in this first row. Uh, of course, politically, it will not be easy for countries to say, we commit that for 2030, but we have changed our minds, and already by 2017 or 2018, uh, we present much better numbers. Of course, that's of course, the direction in which we should push these countries, but it, it will be, of course, complicated in a political sense. So we have to show that Action is taking place, action is accelerating, technology costs are going down, 
And so there is many more possibilities to achieve, to overachieve what was presented in Paris. But we have to do that very, very quickly. But as, as, as always, you have to have the support of the society at large. It can't be just a decision of one minister or even one head of state. To show leadership, they have to be supported by their own society. And so the buy-in of this dramatic change, of this deep transformation, has to be presented to the society as a progress, as a positive future. And again, when I look at what is happening in Europe or even here, we have a long way forward just to present that as a positive future and not just a change, whereas people today in, some, in many countries are afraid of change. Some are deprived of change and some are concerned with change. So we have to really work at the mindset and the philosophy and the vision for the countries to and the society to buy this new project, which implies many transformation and a different growth model that allow people to get access to energy resources, to uh, more food, and at the same time doesn't destroy the planet. So we need political leadership, but it will not fall from the sky. Uh, it's not a miracle. Leadership is not a miracle. It, it is produced by healthy society that really can strive and support leaders to go forward. So in this aspect, I think the work across many actors is a central piece of any success for, for this fight against climate change. In a way, this system at UNFCCC, again, we should not think that this is the center of the world, that climate action is taking place everywhere it has to take place everywhere. But the beauty of the exercise is at least it puts some kind of milestones and a meeting points. So it exerts the pressure to revise and to assess where do we stand and push the different actors that would like really to, to, to do something in a way to meet together, assess where we are, and decide for new steps. That's why I think 2018 is a key milestone. One, because that's the year where we'll make this first assessment. We will have the report of IPCC on what does it take to be at one, to limit temperature at 1.5. It will, the moment where hopefully we decide in Marrakech that the negotiation of the rules of the transparency system, of the nature of this contribution should be decided and finalized by 2018 but that the roadmap for the 100 billion we promise in Cancun will be really clear. But most of that, we knew that it will be a, um, a capacity to invest more and to have innovative, uh, not only behavior, but mechanism to, uh, to really start this development. And I see 2018 at a rallying moment where not only governments would come with the idea that they will overachieve their commitments. Some can revise their contribution. Some just can recognize that they are doing better than what they anticipate. That the technology is much cheaper than what they anticipate. That the model, even the projection for 2050 are finally easier than they anticipate because of this global movement of the economy and the technology innovation. So it's about changing the mindset and we have two short years to get this done, to have a really much more optimistic view. Now we have an agreement, now we have a framework, but then now we have to accelerate action. So I think this, but optimism again doesn't come just from the sky. It's not sort of a miracle. It is created. It is grounded. In particular, it comes from the reassurance that really countries are doing seriously. So the information that we are gathering, the way the countries can present what they are doing, would say the cap on coal consumption in China, or the revision even of the investment in the new coal power plant that China is planning to, in a way to, to close or, or to reduce. These are, and, and you take one by one the different countries, can send these signals we need to collect for 2018. 
But we have to check and this why this your program is so important. Uh, this investment in research and development dynamics induced by the implementation of this commit, and that's why we need this flow of information that you as researchers, as companies, need to know how really the policy framework is moving in many countries just to feel that the market is expanding and that this is a real good reason to accelerate research and investment in innovation. So we have to create that interaction, that positive loop. We can have negative loops, neg negative self-fulfilling prophecy. Paris is based on a positive self-fulfilling prophecy. And, but this one has to be nurtured and constructed. Uh, if we don't want the, the bankruptcy, we want the success, we have to work hard at giving that signal. And just to, to try to finish now, I'd like to uh, uh, have two or three issues that seems to me very important, including uh, just immediately for Marrakesh. In Marrakesh, I would like to see that this invitation for countries to prepare and present long-term low emission development strategies are really, really admitted and supported by governments. No country has a plan already today to reduce emission to 2050 consistent with the objective of well below 2 degrees. We don't have it. We need to prepare them. We need to look frankly at what does it take. Again, to just to understand what the carbon budget means. To set the new role of NDCs. So that's why I will personally, as a high-level champion for climate for, in the UN United Nations, launch this platform after Marrakesh that government, cities, regions, and, and businesses would work together to understand, to imagine what does it look like what the economy will look like in a deep decarbonizing future. But finally, I think we, we have to work, again, not only, and it was a big lesson of Paris, and I maintain that the only way to succeed, it's good to work uh, within the UNFCCC world, but we have to work everywhere, in the G7, in the G20, on these uh, financial meetings of the multilateral development bank, through the... <coughs> The, the, stability, the financial stability board, through the Montreal Protocol, we, ha we have had uh, some weeks ago a big success with the amendment uh, to phase down uh, HFCs and to now the aviation and, and many more. Even on the maritime, maritime, we have some more. And we should continue to leverage on non-state actors. Uh, and we had a fairly complex infrastructure before Paris. It's there. Uh, there are meeting points very important. Davos next year, by January or February, I don't remember the date, will be an important moment to rally. We have to maintain climate in the political agenda, uh, but not only on the government side, but the cities, the regions, the business side, uh, globally. And so, and finally, we have to remind ourselves that this positive loop between domestic discussion and the international discussion is the best way to get things done. Of course, the best result was obtained through the US-China dialogue and joint commitments, joint announcement. But there was always and also small countries, vulnerable countries that put the pressure on the biggest emitters, like the small islands, like the most vulnerable countries, that finally obliged us to reconsider and to not to have an agreement, a minimum agreement, but the most ambitious agreement possible. And of course, we have then to really progressively fade the north-south divide around the climate action, recognizing the, the, the responsibilities of developed countries and their responsibility not only in uh, cutting emission even more drastically, but as well innovating and sharing this innovation with others. So that's lessons I would like to draw from Paris and we'll be happy to respond to any question. Thank you. Should I stay there, Sally? Stay there. Okay, so we will take questions from the audience, and we have people with microphones. So could you please um, just say your name and, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, who, uh, who would like to go first? Uh, don't be shy, yeah, okay. Um, 
I thank you. I, I very much uh, appreciate the, the core of what you're saying. And let me rephrase it because I, there is a hook on the end of this. The core of what you're saying is the tipping point where we're going, we're at now is not a technology tipping point, but a tipping point of beliefs that the commonality can move forward and there is a positive vision out there. And I think that is behaviorally the most important thing you, uh, important thing you can be doing. Yet even in your talk, you kept bringing up some of the negatives. We're going to put a cap on coal in China. And every time you, one rolls in that negatives, you're undercutting the message of the positive future vision. So the question is, is this well understood in the other leadership that you're doing, working with, that essentially, unless and until you get this positive vision that you're talking about that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, leading to these positives, you're probably not going to make it. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, your reaction. And, and of course, you totally understand my point. Even, of course, uh, we have to, to frame the positive, recognizing the difficulties and the things that has to be done. That's why this tension between voluntary action, uh, the construction of the future in a way, uh, relying on what the countries, the societies wants to do, and the, and the tough constraint of the carbon budget must be combined. Uh, but uh, I think this idea, that Paris was exactly the turning point where government began to think the cost of action, and they transformed that on the, the value of the transformation. And I can say that probably most of the big emitters now, at least some part of the leadership, it's not broad, it's not everyone, but are sharing this transformational narrative. Uh, but at the same time, again, we have to maintain the tension on where do we stand and how fast we have to act and how fast we have to find the, the, the alternatives. You're totally right. We, if we speak just on capping coal, what does it mean? Meaning that we will reduce energy consumption in China? Probably they can do much more on energy efficiency in industry in particular, but they need alternatives, and they are working very seriously on that. So this tension, I think, is important. I, I like the fact that I spoke after Sally, because Sally just reminded us what is the envelope. We can't ignore that. And again, just speaking with students yesterday, I was telling many countries were very much in favor, in favor of the 1.5 as a temperature goal. The same ones, the same delegation, the same government was saying, but we don't want any reference to decarbonization. So in a way, you have to maintain, when you have in a way to progressively introduce that knowledge, that recognition, that learning process, that's why I'm so keen on this 2050 strategy because that's a way where everyone will recognize what does it take to, to, to get there, but with a positive narrative. So, but thank you, you just, understood perfectly what I'm trying to do, and I think it's now shared and shared by many, many. Okay, I have another question. Yeah, right there in the middle. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your talk. I'm David Cole from Carbon Free Palo Alto. Do you ever see a time when, out of these talks, we would realize a global price on carbon, which would help you realize this goal worldwide and finance all the things that we need to do, at least put the pressure in the right direction. Even our sponsor here today, ExxonMobil, has been pushing for something like this. Why can't we get this done? Um, <clears throat> I have a very simple response, which is, it's a little bit like trade policies today in the, in the global discussion. When you are just going into this sort of domain of the sovereignty of nations, policies and tax policies in particular are really very deep. Whatever, if you talk about authoritarian regime or democratic regime, 
you know, the tax policy is something very strong in where governments, but more than that, countries or citizens would like to decide on the policy regime they accept to. That's, I think, a given. So to go to a sort of a global tax system, which global carbon price is about, we have to, in a way, build in this in the process where it is accepted and adopted, recognizing that the, there is a, a, a common consent to pay for that. Uh, in this country, tax and democracy is part of the history. Uh, and it's a very important feature. And so uh, the first element was this one. You can't impose a global carbon price because, again, it is an element of a tax policy that citizen or even authoritarian government would like to keep control on. That said, so we need to make recognize that this externality has a cost, not only for the, the national citizen, because it has, of course, and it was the first step to get Paris done to convince every government, and the scientists, of course, have done a fantastic job to do that, that there was already a negative externality on themselves, and of course, a global negative externality on others. So nowadays, uh, based on this uh, philosophy of Paris, which is you have to keep the sovereignty in the hands of the ones who want to keep it. If not, you just face resistance and conflict. So you have to build in the carbon price in each domestic context, which is hopefully and already happening. The range of the carbon pricing, and I don't know where we stand, but probably around 50 countries where there is some kind of carbon tax or an equivalent of carbon tax or an equivalent uh, subsidy to renewable energy, which is finally the same, even if it's not that clear as a signal, as a market signal. We, I think, and I think World Bank will publish this in Marrakesh, a report to see that we now, in many sort of territories, we have this carbon price in place, but they are diverse. And, uh, but the range is not that high. Of course, you have Sweden with 136 uh, euro a ton, but, and, and most of the prices will range from 5 euros a ton to four, six or 7 dollars to, to, to 10 or 15 the carbon price that China will put in place next year it <clears throat> will be around probably below 10. And so I think it will progressively now, the discussion between the countries who have very diverse, who have different carbon price we can begin. So again, asking for a global one, pose the exact sort of question of who can decide of this global carbon price. And you take <clears throat> the 136 euro a ton, to in Sweden, you apply this price, for example, which is probably the price that makes a big difference to India, and then energy prices in India just are impossible for people to pay. So we have a distributive aspect and a, f a problem of a acquisitive power, and the parity there, that I think that's why, uh, again, even if the business, and in particular the global business, would be, of course, happy and naturally happy to see a level playing field, we need to recognize that this has a progress and it has to be a really nationally determined. <clears throat> we will face very soon trade impacts because of this divergence of carbon prices. But I think uh, that will be a way to, to make these prices converge. So again, it would have been fantastic to have a consensus of one price. I don't believe myself that we can get, because of the divergence in economy, on one price but we can begin to discuss about the range. But above all, I think it has to be grounded on really a choice of the domestic policy. Thank you for your presentation. I really like Jim Sweeney's uh, summary of uh, the key point. But if I take what Jim said and take it forward, which is that, suppose it's a tipping point on the beliefs. Would, uh, a way to test that experiment would be to do international surveys or some other feedback mechanism to say whether, what you are, whether the knobs you are turning is really making an impact on the beliefs. So did you and your group and others talk about 
testing the feedback on whether it's making a difference or not. And here, I want to make a plug for John Krosnick, who I don't know if he's in the audience, who is a professor. Who is a, who is a professor of political psychology at Stanford, who has 20 years history around public attitudes on this. A fascinating question and comment, and thank you for that. Um, uh, of course, uh, we, we, we try. We try before Paris even to try to have international surveys. We didn't have the resources to do that. It's quite expensive. And we discussed with many uh, academics, from, in particular from the US, who just maintain these global surveys. Uh, we did some where we saw, it was interesting, that even if the government position on climate were very diverse, the citizens were more or less in the same page about the perception of the risk. Now the perception of the tipping point. We are not, I think we are not there because, again, for the moment, the idea of having a change in beliefs was sort of focused on the, the decision makers, the ones who are really uh, involved in that discussion. So now we have to expand that. And that, of course, is a big question. How we expand that understanding? How we expand the understanding that we could have different transportation models, that we have different models, that, uh, uh, that is a big work. So if we would, probably if we would do the survey today, we would not have a lot of results because most people ignore what Paris is about. Uh, but that said, if we begin to work deep on what I was calling the buying by the society of this transformation project, like Modi is doing in India on renewables, that's clear. You, probably if we do a survey in India now, the perception that renewable energy is a very positive solution and is going on, I think we will have probably a, a yes, no, um, I suppose. Uh, but so you see that it depends on the capacity of governments to sell the, pro to sell the project. So I would say it's essential then to track that. So I would be very happy to have a research program on that, certainly. Thank you, Professor Subiana, for your great presentation. Uh, my name is Qing. I have a question. For projects uh, or initiatives related to climate change adaptation or mitigation, or even in development field, how can you keep them sustainable when the initial grants finished, uh, especially grants? I think loans is maybe another um, category. The, the, the big thing, and you, you're right, in some cases, it's very difficult to create an economic model out of this project. Um, but we should try to, even in adaptation. Um, so that's one. First, try to uh, make understand that if you build a more sustainable infrastructure, resilient to extreme events, you are creating a benefit. And, and in a way, the beneficiaries should be able to participate to that, so maintain it in, um, over time. Um, the, the big question of how the official development aid will continue and increase, it's of course a difficult question. The, most of the agencies in the developed world are faced with budget constraints, and of course because of the slowdown since 2008 now. And uh, at the same time, there is a push and there is an increase in this official budget, which I think will, we will see the results in many countries that there will be a new flow of resources with all the issue about how you, you use it efficiently. But I think the big question now is to try to use this grant dimension to really leverage more investment. And so a project that could not survive without grants um, would be probably very difficult uh, to maintain over time. And adaptation, for example, or mitigation are actions we have to maintain over time. They would not just give the result uh, very quickly. So I think we have to think new model of combining public and private finance. We are still not there. I think the ideas are there, but it's not really happening. But I don't see any other solution. OK, uh, I'll ask you a question. Uh, so, so basically, the, the question will be, when I finish it, you know, how is help being provided to some of these countries 
particularly when you consider developing long-term plans. I mean, if you think of many of these you know, emerging economies that have the, the primary goal of you know, raising people from poverty and building an industrial foundation so that there are good jobs and, and so forth. And so on one hand, you know, that's an overarching goal. And at the same time, you know, they're global citizens and participating in decarbonization. I mean, these are really hard issues. You know, how, how do you build an energy system from sort of the ground up that doesn't have a robust fossil fuel background? And, and I wonder how much actual help is, is being provided to these countries to think through to 2050. You know, how do you meet the dual goals of increasing energy access and, and reliability and quality? Uh, but at the same time decarbonizing and, 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 and if they're getting help, who's doing that and is, is that sort of an unmet need that we you know, should all be asking ourselves, well, how could we, how could we, how could we help? Uh, I'm, I'm, at that moment, we are there. I think, uh, as I said, nobody really, even here in this country or in my country in France, nobody has a clear view. So in a way, we are more or less in the same situation. So, that's why I think there is an, a need of research, a need of thinking, a need of dialogue. Uh, again, nobody, there is no one pathway. There are several, certainly. Uh, one, because we don't know, there is a lot of uncertainty out there, even by 2050, which is now very close. Uh, but at the same time, the, the choice can be different. It will be different. It's totally different to imagine an energy system in a very sort of where uh, habitat is very distributed, uh, whether at the contrary, like Europe, for example, you have a very concentrated type of habitat. That's the solution, or not the same, of course. So, but we need this. We need help. We need dialogue. We need reflection. And uh, that's why I, I'm so keen in launching that in Marrakesh. And uh, I have really have an incredible response from governments. Incredible. Even the, the head of delegation of Iran and, her, and the minister of environment came to me to say, we want to do a diversification plan for Iran. We don't want to rely on oil over and over. And uh, of course, you may have heard about Saudi Arabia, but at the same time, Jamaica or even the small islands want to just begin to think about the future. So it is an enormous amount of ideas, discussion or research. And, and yes, again, nobody has a recipe, but we have to think through. Uh, my name is Claire Colster. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I think this question may have been somewhat asked, but um, uh, in two parts. So one, you stress the role of, uh, of MDBs and the need for them to provide finance, particularly for developing countries. Uh, how would you, did you think of having some kind of NDC equivalent uh, for them to provide? And then um, a, second, a second part to that question. Um, for those countries that haven't ratified the agreement yet, or perhaps won't, uh, do you have some kind of idea or structure in place to, um, to account for, for example, cross-border emissions between countries that will have ratified the agreement and those that won't or haven't? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I would like in, in Marrakesh to, to conclude that we have as as you suggested, some kind of clear demand on these financial institutions. They say they want to do more, they want to decarbonize their portfolio, they want to leverage private funding. So what is their plan? I think we need to do that. For the moment, the conversation is really going a little bit in circles. Everyone waiting for the banks to do, or the public funding to come, or the, the institutional investors to come in. So we need to just to, okay, is that the conversation is there, but now what do we do? And are you accountable of what you say you will be doing? So in, I hope I can get that, I'm not sure, but I will work to really deeply to that in Marrakesh. And um, on, the, on the other side, I'm very optimistic about the ratification. Uh, I think Saudi Arabia is ratifying today or tomorrow We'll have probably 100 countries by Marrakesh already. Maybe I, I'm a little optimistic, but around that. So again, to my surprise, because as I said yesterday in another conversation, uh, when we take out the end date of the ratification process for Paris, 
we were saying maybe we could do that a little before 2020 and that will be give a little more dynamic again. And finally, it was done in one year, in less than one year. So that's in a way the, so my, my, in a way, and probably my question, uh, countries are really committed to that. Do they realize totally what does it take? Do they, is this the knowledge really uh, beginning to really penetrate all the sectors? Probably no, but you have this feeling that we have to do it. And uh, I think we are there. I think many governments, many leaders say we have to do it. We don't know exactly how, but we have to do it. So that's why I'm very optimistic about ratification. Doesn't mean that the implementation will be simple, at the contrary. It, it is very difficult. Great. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, that was thank you, Sally.